This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 680, recorded on November 11th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm looking quickly to find the weather. Um, it's 75 or it's 70 degrees and cloudy. It's a nice fall day. It is, it very is a nice. nice fall day. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 67 degrees and sunny, headed for 81 and sunny. It's a glorious day. <laughs> glorious day in Texas. All right, today we have three special guests uh, to join us and talk about long haul COVID, post COVID syndrome from Body Politic, Fiona Lowenstein. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Good to be here. Nice to see you all. You too. And from Columbia University School of Public Health, Maddie Hornig. Welcome to TWIV. Oh, thank you, Vincent. You're, Appreciate you're, being here. You're typically not far from my office. I, I happen to be at home today. You look like you might be at Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I'm home, and it's uh, downtown uh, Manhattan. Okay. Next to the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> and from, well, I think so far, uh, with the exception of Rich, we're all close together now. This uh, guest is quite far away. Uh, he is a senior fellow in public health and journalism at the Center for Global Public Health at the School for Public Health, University of California, Berkeley. Dave Tuller, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Dave has been multiple times on, on TWIV. Yes. Talking about MECFS. Uh, right. And uh, today we will certainly touch on that as well. And this is was actually David's uh, idea to get together a group of individuals and talk about you know, what has been called long haulers or post COVID-19. And maybe we can just start by saying, are those two things the same or are they different? What's the right terminology? Fiona, what do you think? Well, there's, there's some debate about this right now. So um, long haul COVID seems to be more popular amongst patients in the US and then in the UK and Europe and, and globally, long COVID seems to be the, the term that's used more commonly. There are patients and uh, researchers out there who take issue with the idea of post-COVID syndrome, because I guess we're not sure exactly whether these patients are, you know, experiencing something that is no longer a result of the virus or whether, you know, these are symptoms that are directly related to the acute phase of COVID. Um, and then there's also a couple groups on uh, Facebook that I've seen are advocating for the term long-term COVID-19 because they think it sounds more scientific, LTC-19. So uh, the name Naming process is very much up in the air right now. Um, I think everyone agrees it would be good to have kind of one name that we're sticking to. Um, but uh, yeah, those are the options that I've uh, heard so far. Okay. Fiona, do you know how the name long hauler came up? Did someone come up with that or did it just sort of arise generically when the, you know, in, in terms of people talking online? So I know that the term long COVID was coined by Dr. Alyssa Perego, who is in Italy and she is a long COVID patient herself. I'm not exactly sure where long hauler came from. I think it was similarly someone in the United States who who started using that. And, and you know, I'm sure that there's someone in particular um, who I'm not giving credit to right now that I should be. Um, but I don't know why there are these different terms for the U.S. versus other countries. Do people feel like some one term represents them and other terms don't represent them? Or what is the debate about exactly? Um, I think people are fine with using long hauler and long COVID interchangeably. Um, but the fear with using post COVID syndrome is that it's going to kind of separate this, this group because long COVID patients is really any patient who's experiencing, you know, symptoms for more than two to four weeks after the initial symptom onset. And so I think initially there was, there, there has been some debate about, you know, do we include people who have been diagnosed with, let's say, for instance, ME at the six month point, are those people still considered long COVID people are people who are, you know, five weeks out from symptom onset can considered to be part of the same group as people who have been diagnosed with something else. And so I think that's where some of this, 
you know, uh, frustration about the term post COVID syndrome or, or wanting to distance themselves from that because they, I think for advocacy reasons, these patients all want to be considered part of the same group, even though, you know, there are differences. I mean, I had COVID and, and I had long COVID, but I got better, you know, I, re- I recovered after three months. So there's also those who, you know, have it for a while and, and recover and we don't have a different term for those people. So, um, I think there's political reasons behind kind of grouping us all together, but, um, eventually I would imagine that separate dis- terms will exist for these different groups. Mady, what do you think? Well, I think that there's a, a couple of things. First of all, I found online that in dictionary.com and Miriam uh, Webster Dictionary Online, Long Holler, Holler now has a COVID-19 specific definition. And some of those came even from uh, people in the UK They're as well. And so, so you could, you know, so it's a long hauler is a person who suffers from symptoms of COVID-19 for longer than two weeks and generally for several months uh, and sometimes also referred to as long COVID. Uh, the other day there was a, an interview uh, with uh, the group Survivor Corps, also that uh, with with uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and there was a uh, discussion of the terms used. And long term COVID came up, and I think that that you know, first of all, it's I like it because it's grammatically more correct. What you know, long COVID. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but um, <laughs> but the <laughs> but it, there is this long term aspect of it, and we also uh, what we don't know it it allows for more. Uh, of the unknowns that we know we have, the known unknowns, you know? So we don't really know, is this long-term COVID or is it a long-term viral issue in in a generic way? It, are there aspects of this that are mapping to what happens with other types of severe viral infections? For example, even SARS-1, right? You know, so uh, SARS had uh, some persistent symptoms, people who developed uh, features that were consistent with the diagnosis of ME-CFS over, over time also happened with Ebola. You know, so is it, is it something that's unique? What is, and then is it just a different flavor, if you will, you know, if we could pretend this was ice cream, you know, is it just, it is post, is long-term COVID just a different flavor of this, you know, phenomenon? I think that we should really allow for the possibility that we don't know everything yet and we need research so, so tremendously. You know, I've also, uh, am in a position with a sort of an insider's view as, first of all, as a doc um, who's been working in researching uh, MECFS for, you know, for quite some time. I don't know how many of your listeners know or don't know what MECFS is, my algebra we should, we should We should do that, you know, yeah. just to be sure. Yeah, myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, not for short, but for <laughs> perhaps an easier acronym. Most of us uh, in the field like the term ME better, because fatigue in itself is not a very accurate description of what that phenomenon looks like. But it is a disorder that is highly disabling. Uh, Approximately three quarters of the time, individuals will note that there's a viral-like onset at the beginning of their symptoms. It's systemic. Uh, So there are multiple uh, heterogeneous uh, symptoms. Post-exertional malaise or post-exertional decline is one of the major features along with brain fog, which is cognitive problems, difficulties with word finding, other short-term memory issues, as well as pain for many individuals, muscle pain uh, and difficulties in and, uh, you know, tolerating certain types of activities. In particular, some people have uh, blood pressure and pulse regulation issues, autonomic nervous system problems that make it difficult for them to spend life in the vertical world, sitting up, sitting up, uh, sort of going against gravity and, you know, and having your, uh, and, and trying to get your blood pressure and pulse regulated so that you can achieve your normal set of activities is, is, uh, is a real problem. And that 
overlap so much with what many people are reporting in uh, long-term COVID. <laughs> are, there, are there distinct differences that you can point to uh, between the two uh, conditions or is this it is just too fuzzy? It's becoming an area of sort of diagnostic confusion for clinicians at this point because it's six months is when you typically would diagnose ME. And so there's a lot of debate in the ME community particularly about whether, and also in the long COVID community from what I see, about whether people do have ME at six months or whether they don't and how they can be. And if they are, meet the diagnostic criteria, does that mean they have ME even though if post-COVID might be a different thing than what we typically think of as ME-CFS. So the boundaries are very kind of squishy and porous, and nobody actually, I think at this point, really knows. I think one of the telling things and sort of the cardinal, you know, and, and it, especially because CFS has normally, at the entity has normally standardly been considered sort of a psychiatric phenomenon that people need, you know, this exercise to become reconditioned as if they're just deconditioned or they need cognitive behavior therapy in the UK uh, to alleviate them of the false beliefs that they actually have an organic illness. So that's sort of the paradigm that the post-COVID is kind of collapsing or falling, colliding against. And so there's sort of a big debate going on now about whether these people do have ME or whether it has to be a separate thing and whether it's good for people with ME or good for people with long COVID if they're combined. I think it's all being, it's all a big mishmash and nobody quite knows. And yeah. I think ladies involved are involved in trying to help sort that out. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, what, it, it's the, certainly relevant to talk about them together. Yeah, one of the really huge dilemmas, particularly in uh, individuals who are now sort of at the six, seven plus month uh, duration range, I happen to be one of them. Um, the is that there are uh, were difficulties in gaining access to diagnostic tests so that one could have symptoms that were difficult to explain by any other known medical phenomenon. Uh, but nonetheless, one may have missed the uh, window of opportunity for certain types of tests to show up as, as positive. tests have different uh, false positive false negative rates. So that's going to remain a challenge, uh, particularly for the individuals who are at the leading edge of this long duration group with long term COVID like symptoms that apps may have other explanations. I'm, you know, I'm, I've been test negative. Um, we think we missed the window and I have antibody producing problems from long before, uh, what appeared to be a COVID-19 scenario. So, you know, it, it personally that may have, you know, affected them. That could be the case for other individuals as well. But we need to really start to zero in and, and, and think about what the symptom complexes are. We're looking in our research, really looking very intently at that. So I'm working with a group that has uh, been involved with ME-CFS research for some time called Solve ME. They have a mobile symptom tracker and registry and biobank that they've, they're in sort of a, a new phase, phase two, which happened to have been planned for a launch in May 2020 on International MECFS Awareness Day. And um, it had been two years in the making, but of course we're now adding on this component that's COVID-19 specific to try to understand what the symptoms are, to do this longitudinally and to collect biological samples longitudinally as well to try to understand what the predictors are for the different trajectories probably be three different major uh, pathways. So one group, let's say over a six month period of observation and using that six months, because that happens to be a period where we're thinking about ME diagnosis requiring six months persistence of symptoms uh, in order to make the diagnosis. So, six, uh, so at the six month point, some people who had long term COVID uh, however we end up defining that, um, will end up getting better. And we will have biological samples as well as look at their clinical symptoms uh, and we'll be able to learn from that and perhaps even translate some of the things biologically that 
may have been associated with their getting better into something that could help the other two groups, which are not likely to be as, uh, you know, as, as, as fortunate. Um, second group, I think, is a group that would not be diagnosed with ME, but would have some serious long-term disability. And individuals, we know there's a portion of COVID-19 patients who have infection in the heart or evidence of uh, coagulation, you know, so blood clotting and or, or you know, perhaps even uh, viral uh, destruction of certain heart tissues that will uh, lead to uh, some deficits in their cardiac function and that those may be long term. Same thing in the lungs. Right. And this is, you know, primar- primarily we think of this as a respiratory disease, but of course it affects so many different organ systems. So we think that some of the damage that occurs may be uh, more directly related to at least the virus itself or its immediate immune and coagulation pathway effects, clotting effects. Right. And then uh, that that group may need a different type of rehabilitation than the third group, which is unknown really as to what the percentage is going to be. But if we take other, uh, if we take hints, let's say from Epstein-Barr virus infection, infectious mono, about 10 to 12% of people get, uh, of of individuals who have infectious mono end up with an ME diagnosis. So, and we're going to, you know, we're going to try to understand all those different, uh, all those different groups. One, one, uh, Lenny Jason. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, both Fiona and Mady, you've mentioned that you um, have had some experience as a long-term COVID patient. Um, if either of you are comfortable, can you tell us a little bit about that experience um, and how that was for you personally? Yes, that was my question. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I'm I'm happy to share a little bit. So I I got sick at the very beginning of the pandemic hitting the the U.S. or at least the beginning of kind of the media covering community spread in the U.S. Um, I live in New York City. I first started showing symptoms on March 13th. Um, it was kind of the classic COVID symptoms that we were hearing about respiratory um, and fever. And then I was hospitalized briefly on March 16th for shortness of breath. Um, I was not on a ventilator. I was given supplemental oxygen and observed for a couple of nights um, and then sent home after my shortness of breath and my fever seemed to be gone. Um, when I got home, I was kind of cleaning my room up a little bit, trying to get ready to go to bed. And I, I took out a lavender essential oil, which I thought, oh, I'll, you know, put this around to make me feel calm. And I brought it to my nose and I couldn't smell it at all. You know, I, I it was like holding a, just a glass of water. And at this point, I had not heard anything about loss of smell. So I thought this is very bizarre. Um, I happen to have been, I'm fairly certain that I was infected by a close friend and colleague at, at Body Politic, which prior to the pandemic was a queer feminist wellness collective and event series in New York City. Um, she had come over on March 10th for one last in-person meeting, um, got sick more or less before my eyes, got very pale, said I don't feel well, went home right away. Um, and so in that first kind of couple of weeks of, of my being sick, the one silver lining was that I had this friend that I was texting with who was also going through a lot of the same symptoms. And so, you know, maybe an hour after I tried to smell that, that lavender and couldn't smell it, she texted me and said, have you lost your sense of smell? Because I have. Um, and I found this Twitter thread of people talking about them losing their senses of smell. Um, and from there, the symptoms kind of just the odd symptoms and the symptoms outside of the ones that we had been hearing about just continued to pop up. So there were I had severe GI issues for about two to three weeks, um, excessive weight loss, partially as a result of not really being able to eat anything because of the GI issues, um, intense fatigue, headaches, eye pain. Um, I had not had I had had a cough and shortness of breath in the first week, but I hadn't had any. Uh, you know, nasal congestion or sore throat. And that started up um, in that kind of second and third week, um, intense sinus pain. Um, And this all lasted, you know, kind of with symptoms cycling on and off until early June. Um, I also had dermatological issues, hives, rashes, just very sensitive skin in general, um, and this intense, intense fatigue. Um, And uh, so, so I think, you know, one of the things also when we're talking about the similarities between long COVID patients and patients with ME, I think, you know, there are these 
kind of similarities in terms of symptoms, like the post-exertion malaise, which I myself experienced. I would do, you know, an interview or, or try and write an article. I'm, I'm a journalist. Um, and, and then, you know, I would just crash on the couch for, for three hours afterward. I wouldn't have intense light sensitivity and eye pain and headaches. Um, but there's also real similarities in terms of kind of the quest for adequate, adequate and competent care. Um, and I think that that's something that, that David touched on that, you know, the, ME patients have often been psychologized and told that, you know, their illness is in their heads. And that's not something that I personally experienced because I was one of those, those lucky few in New York City that was able to get hospitalized and thus get tested for COVID at a point where I was able to test positive. But most of the other long COVID patients in New York that I'm in touch with who got sick in March and April were not able to access that diagnostic test. And as a result, are having a really hard time kind of proving their illness. Um, and as more stories and studies come out about the you know, link between COVID and, and the brain and, and mental health. I think, um, you know, people continue to be a bit confused about what this means. And um, there are still patients that are going to the doctor, you know, saying I've been sick for three months and, and the doctor is saying it's, it's, it's anxiety or it's a panic attack or it's even, you know, PTSD or something like that. Um, so it, it gets very confusing, especially since we know that, you know, COVID does have some impact on the brain. And then also obviously being isolated and and being alone can cause mental health issues just just in and of themselves, as well as having you know a virus that you're seeing sensationalized on the news every day. That certainly you know makes makes you feel pretty anxious. Um, so so it's complicated, but I think that's another reason why these two groups of patients are kind of finding each other. Um, you know, there are treatments that ME patients have have relied on that that are like pacing um, and and you know other methodologies like that that I think COVID patients are finding useful. But there's also this shared experience of trying to access care and and having trouble because clinicians are not always educated on these conditions. So at the so, moment you uh, were you were fine, you said you'd recovered? Yeah, I mean I I'm hesitant to say that I've fully recovered uh just because, you know, we're we're still I, I've I've been very cautious during this whole pandemic and so I'm still mostly staying in my house. I'm not back to kind of the usual hustle and bustle of getting on the subway every day and and so I'm back to my usual routine, you know, for the pandemic, but I, I will have to see once things kind of, you know, once, once I get back to what, what I was doing beforehand, um, the, I do have a few kind of remaining issues, um, while I was sick. And this is something that a lot of patients with menstrual cycles have reported. Um, I would have worsened symptoms during my monthly period. Um, and as I started to get better, um, that, that week of my monthly period just still continued to be a time when I would experience some of these old symptoms, the headache and the eye pain, and occasionally even, you know, some, some nose and throat congestion. Um, I, I also will say that I, I don't think my circulation is what it was, um, before, before having COVID. I, I experienced numbness in, in my hands and feet, um, and tingling while I was sick, which is something a lot of patients have reported. Um, and I noticed that my feet are falling asleep, you know, a bit more, often than they used to. Um, but at this point, you know, again, as New York is seeing cases rise again, I, I'm not going out and getting full workups from a ton of different specialists because I am well enough to, to do what I need to do. Um, and even earlier in the pandemic, you know, my PCP was actually wonderful and we were in frequent touch, but it was April in New York City. I mean, she she's a, you know, Medicaid and Medicare provider. She was very, very busy. So, um, you know, it, unless something was really debilitating, I, I wasn't bothering her. And, and often her answer was also, could be COVID, could not be COVID. We don't really know. So, um, yeah. So I, I tentatively say that I'm, I'm mostly recovered because I'm back to, you know, exercising and riding my bike and working 12 hours a day at my computer like most of us are right now. But, uh, yeah. So in the, in the end, how long did uh, you have any kind of what you would describe as symptomology? And how did that, did it change over time? What was the evolution? Um, I experienced symptoms from early March until early June. Um, and, uh, the symptoms did change slightly. For instance, the, the skin issues, the kind of rashes and hives didn't pop up until probably month two or three. Um, and the GI issues were much more intense, uh, at the, toward kind of the end of March, beginning of April than they were later on. Um, and there was a slow, you know, process of getting better, um, and, and having these symptoms not be quite as debilitating, but I wouldn't say that it was linear by any means because it was really, you know, one day of, of restored energy and then the next day feeling, you know, worse off than I had the day before. And so it was a very, a very jagged, slow upward trajectory for me personally. And have you had repeated uh, COVID tests and what are they like? And have you had any serology done? 
Um, so I have not actually. I, I tested positive in March and then at that time was told by the uh, hospital to get a negative test result um, to try and test again uh, within, you know, a week or two. But tests were not available. And I called the Department of Health and they said, you know, those hospital discharge instructions are incorrect. You should not leave your house. You should stay home. You should not go and get tested again. Um, and that is what I did. So I quarantined for a very long time. Um, I was in my room for two weeks. And then my partner ended up having COVID as well. So it was just the two of us kind of staying in our apartment, not even going grocery shopping for over a month. Um, my partner has has tested negative since uh, having COVID. I just still kind of stay inside. So I, and, I, and I'm feeling mostly better. So I don't, I don't, I try not to go into, you know, crowded testing centers for that reason. Um, and I haven't tested for antibodies simply because, you know, I got that positive PCR test. So it, it seems, seems that I did have COVID. Um, yeah. I was just wondering kind of, uh, what, what your immune response profile was, you know? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. What, Fiona, maybe. do you have a sense of other people in the group or, uh, you know, also having a similar course that most, uh, uh, many of them or some of them are sort of, sort of, you know, feeling like they've recovered after three months or four months or, are many still just going on with the same symptoms with no apparent, you know, improvement or is it all over the map? It's very mixed. I mean, the, so the support group I run, which has about 9,000 active patients in it right now, um, most of the people who are active in that group are people who are experienced, still experiencing symptoms. And that's, you know, often because once you stop experiencing symptoms, you sometimes feel that there's no longer a need to, to be in a COVID support group. Right. Um, but I noticed actually, Recently, there were some people in the group and on Twitter saying, is there anyone who has recovered from this? And, and that was when I actually saw a bunch of people speaking up and saying like me, yes, I was sick for three months or four months or six months. And now I'm feeling, you know, 90 percent better, 99 percent better. But there are still a lot of patients and the majority of the patients that I hear from, um, especially the ones that I connected with in March and April, they are still sick uh, mm -hmm. six and seven months down the line. And many of them have been diagnosed with POTS or, uh, you know, mast cell activation syndrome or, um, you know, in some cases, ME. So, um, and in some cases, you know, their doctors don't really know what's going on with them. Uh, so that it, it seems to be mixed. Um, there are some people who have said, oh, things seem to get better around, you know, the four month mark and then they get worse again and then they get better. Um, but I'm not seeing again, I think we're comparing slightly different groups because this long COVID you know, right. term is somewhat of an umbrella term that includes anyone who is sick for more than two to four weeks. So it's a little bit hard to tell, you know, how these, how these, you know, trajectories of recovery right. or symptoms actually align. Maybe could you Maybe sh share with us your experience? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I, in retrospect, I think that this probably began at the end of March for me with a tickle in the throat and, uh, you know, it just feeling a little congestion and, and so forth. And I was coughing, but I really thought it was all related to allergies. It was a little early at the end of March for allergies to begin. Uh, but I, and I hadn't, I had been very careful. So I really had, you know, I was out of the house only to go to the pharmacy um, and, you know, trying to manage, I, I have a, I, my, uh, older son lives on his own and has autism and needed his seizure meds. And so I went out to the pharmacy, uh, to, to get his meds and, uh, it was approached by somebody, you know, appeared to be an unhomed individual and, uh, came up close. And, you know, at that time we were told, you know, we weren't wearing masks, right? I mean, I was covering myself, you know, but we, you know, there was the whole, there were no masks to be had. And so, you know, we weren't wearing masks then. And so that's the only contact that I know of other than living in a big apartment building where if I can smell whatever misadventure whatever culinary misadventure is happening next door from the neighboring apartment, you know, stuff is coming through the, the HVAC system. So uh, that's the only other place where I could have had exposure. Anyway, so I, st I began with those allergy type symptoms at the end of March. And then uh, again, in retrospect, a couple of weeks later, uh, so you know, the middle of April, I had uh, what is now popularly known as COVID toes. I thought it was just from being in my home without 
wearing shoes or socks and scraping my toes. You know, I just didn't think anything of it, but I had to go out to the pharmacy again. (laughs) And my toes were so swollen that I could not get shoes on. I was wearing Ugg boots, you know, because I couldn't get my shoes on. And that was very unusual. And I do have uh, circulation issues, you know, so I have a constellation of autoimmune problems and immune problems that have been followed for, you know, many, many years. So something called Raynaud syndrome. So I have a long history of circulatory stuff. This was different, very different. And then um, on April 24th, and you remember this, you know, so I'm also on very high dose aspirin, long term, always. I take, you know, 650 milligrams of aspirin every day um, for these, you know, all these autoimmune diseases. And so I got uh, what some people may say isn't really a fever, you know, 99.8 degrees. And for somebody with 97.4 degrees as in their normal, uh, you know, uh, temperature, you know, it was 98 point, uh, you know, uh, uh, 99.8 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, woke me up at four o'clock in the morning. I've never had anything like this before. You know, just waking me up and just, you know, that, that's it, you're sick, right? It is this distinct moment um, to be able to even know what hour it, it, it occurred. And uh, I had uh, swollen glands, uh, sore throat, um, you know, along with the fever. And I had fever for 12 days. Um, that persisted even though I doubled my aspirin dose. Um, and it persisted through all that through all that time. My respiratory effects were uh, m- milder, I think, than most individuals. But I was here on my own at that time, um, and uh, you know, for the first time in my life, I. I alerted the, you know, the building staff and I said, look, guys, I'm leaving. I, a friend had sent me some face shields that they had 3D printed. And I, uh, you know, I said, they're, they're by the door. I'm not locking my door at night. I might need help, you know. And uh, so and I had uh, pulse ox, you know, my my oxygen did go down to like 88 to 92 range. Not terrible. Um, I didn't feel uh, but it was still being alone was sort of scary, and you know, the docs didn't really think it was that terrible, right? So I slept on my stomach, right? This is the idea of proning, right? So I just figured, okay, I'll sleep on my stomach, and it did seem to, you know, make me feel. I don't know, maybe it was psychological, but my my oxygen uh, uh, saturation also went up, and that actually, in retrospect, all of those things were really mild in a way they were fear provoking, but they were mild compared to the things that I started to have about a week after the fever resolved. So I began to have severe tachycardia. So, uh, uh, you know, my heart rate would rate would race up to about 135 beats per minute or so, lower than perhaps some other individuals have experienced, but uncomfortable um, and a little, you know, unnerving. And uh, I developed swelling in one leg all the way from the toes up to the thigh. Um, and so worried about a blood clot, um, which, you know, was not, you know, was not positive for uh, a, a throb, you know, for, for clot. I did get tested for that. And all of my testing was, was negative. I was also, you know, so at the time of the fever, I played what I call my cancer card. I get followed for some of my immune conditions at Sloan Kettering and had uh, it was able to get in to uh, their uh, urgent care system. And I tested negative for SARS-CoV-2, but also for 12 other agents in a respiratory panel. So you know, no flu, no anything else. So there wasn't any other good explanation for this. But that, um, was, that was several weeks after your initial... Issues with this, exactly, right? exactly. But at that time, I even really had not put it all together. Right. I really thought the onset was fever because everybody was focusing on fever and respiratory symptoms as being sort of the onset of uh, of illness. So, but in retrospect, you know, these, you know, it really, I think the reason that I tested negative was because it had started so much earlier than that. Certainly the COVID toes, you know, were clearly, whether the allergy symptoms were really the start, but the COVID toes had been, was 10 days before 
the fever started. Yeah, it sounds like you're assuming that this is all COVID, which is an assumption. We don't really know. But exactly. It nevertheless sounds like a really drawn out uh, symptomology or the, you know, the, the on-ramp sounds yes. really long. Yeah, it was, it was for me. And that was, I think was unusual. And I think that, you know, so in my research, one of the things that I really want to try to understand is what is that range? How diverse are the clinical presentations? What alters the clinical presentations? And, um, Perhaps there are alternate explanations. I'd be fine in my particular instance to have any clear explanation. I don't really have any great commitment to this being COVID-19. However, all of my eight docs now are, you know, uh, are unable to come up with any other better explanation. And, you know, it's sort of a working hypothesis. But it doesn't really change anything much in terms of management. Uh, have you had serology done? And I've had serology done, but um, the serology test that I had um, was one that uh, includes, I, I, I happen to have a very, I have a, an IgM level, like the acute uh, immunoglobulin level. My IgM level normally because of my blood conditions is like, I don't know, two to three times normal. High, you know, high, so it's usually high, um, and so the question was whether it was swamping out uh, any IgG long ter longer term memory antibodies that uh, that that might exist. So, you know, I've not been able to get any specific testing that would be unique to my you know circum. I might be of interest. To some uh, so, and it also <laughs> sounds like uh, the fever and the tachycardia are just the beginning, right? It's drawn they were. Out beyond they that. were. Although the fever did return, low grade fever did return uh, about a month ago. I had two uh, bouts with return of fever and uh, sore throat. Uh, both of those episodes happened uh, after actually exerting myself, sort of trying to go back to what, you know, Fiona was describing as the 12 to 14 hour day. I'm in a normal work day. Um, I, you know, I do have this uh, inability to really push and I'm trying to be really cautious with that. I'm on what I call the toddler schedule. I have self-enforced uh, and sometimes I do have tantrums. I have self-enforced rest <laughs> periods every day, putting my legs up because I've continued to have on and off uh, swelling either in one leg or both um, if for unclear, you know, for unclear reasons. What so, you, What happens if you don't rest? I mean, if you, if you try to work, can you just, it's just you can't or do you just have a relapse or is it just you, you, you can't? I stop. I, well, I had the two episodes with fever, low grade fever, sore throat, and then just everything stopping. So brain and body just stop. I mean, if I, I mean, if I get to that point, um, I can't, I just, I mean, I can't, it feels like an effort to even hold up an iPhone. <laughs> um, it's it, everything feels like it's just too, too much, uh, to, to do. So I'm really trying to be cautious and it's hard, you know, with a work schedule, I have some colleagues and when we have sort of our zoom joint, uh, you know, workstation, right. So we have our zoom on and sometimes it's on till four in the morning and, uh, you know, and we're, you know, we're working and, uh, I might take a rest during that, you know, during that period. Um, uh, but you know, I can't keep on doing that without having it, uh, you know, cost me in terms of making, making the, uh, the, uh, improvements. So how long has this been going on now? So seven, uh, over seven months. And I still have, you know, again, there's additional issues. They thought that the tachycardia was uh, a thyroid issue. And so they took me off of my 40 year dose of thyroid replacement hormone uh, completely for three weeks. And so I ended up with zero thyroid hormone at all in my, in my system, which portioned things. And we're still trying to figure that out. And then I had new onset hypertension and that was really scary. That was the one feature that really scared me. I mean, I, for, for somebody to have new onset with a systolic over 200, you know, and a diastolic over 115. 
on a regular basis. I mean, 202 over 117, I'm like looking at these numbers, this can't be right. It's an automated one. So I, uh, I, I got out my old uh, Mercury Sphygma manometer, and I uh, and I taught my younger son to uh, to take <laughs> to take uh, blood pressure, and it actually was worse when you know using the old fashioned techniques. So anyway, that's, a, that's a, so, that could, that could yeah. lead to uh, kidney problems, right? Having mm-hmm. sustained high blood a, pressure or a stroke. You know, I mean, yeah. you can have a stroke from you know. So so there's uh, all sorts of issues. Um, uh, lipidemia, so a hyperlipidemia. I have um, creeping up in terms of some glucose issues. So there's all sorts of issues that are you know that are complicated. And this is not unusual when you look. I mean, Body Politic put out such a really fantastic survey of all the symptoms and looked at the uh, frequency of symptoms that people had. You know, over like an eight week period. And so we use that actually. We've mapped those um, those symptoms and uh, the symptoms also. So in a, um, a survey by uh, the other group that I mentioned, Survivor Corps, and map them to the frequency of symptoms um, that are uh, uh, seen in MECFS that are, you know, that are used for, uh, for a, as, uh, you know, tools to understand the heterogeneity of the symptoms in ME. And now we're trying to use that going forward in the platform that was developed by Solve ME. And now this COVID specific platform, um, we're just getting ready to launch, uh, more formally, uh, the COVID specific symptom tracker, and then to follow people for ME. Just one other point on that in terms of docs, docs don't believe you, uh, even if you're a doc, maybe more so if you're a doc, I don't know, but it, that, that has been definitely an issue. I had one doc tell me that, you know, since the thyroid, problem was not the issue for the tachycardia and we didn't really know exactly what else this was. Maybe there were some deep seated, you know, issues that I had that perhaps I should work on, you know, to understand why I had a need to produce tachycardia or something. So Um, we didn't, we didn't really do this, but you're a doc, right? And a doc that ought to know about these things. Absolutely. Uh, Could could you describe, describe your background so that the listeners know? Yeah. So um, well, I don't see patients currently. I'm a, uh, call this a physician scientist. I'm a psychiatrist by training, but I've always been one who is a little bit more unusual, I think, than your garden variety psychiatrist. My interest has always been in infectious and immune factors and brain disorders. Hmm. And uh, while I keep my credentials up, um, I have focused on the basic and translational research for the past 20 years so years. Uh, but before that was doing research in similar fashion, but more including more of a clinical uh, component to, to my day. But the, and you've, I and you've had a that. longer term, a longer term interest in MECFS. Is that correct? How did that yeah, arise? Absolutely. So I actually, the interest began uh, actually when I was still seeing patients um, uh, back again, you know, about 20, uh, 20, 20, 25 years ago, um, I was working, um, was really interested in, uh, treatment resistance, uh, in depression and anxiety disorders and trying to understand what other factors that perhaps this was a misdiagnosis or that there were other factors that were involved. And so I began to, uh, really, uh, work on that in, in much more depth. I had done some work on fibromyalgia uh, as well, which is a related disorder to, uh, to MECFS. Uh, but in the past 15 years, uh, approximately, I've really uh, stepped up my research efforts and have been very involved in trying to understand the biological basis of MECFS, but also really trying to understand the clinical heterogeneity and how that fits with the biological factors, right? So because it's a heterogeneous disease, we don't know whether there's a single final common pathway or, you know, with multiple triggers or whether there's a singular cause. And maybe, again, you get the different flavors because we all come in with maybe some, you know, comorbidities and various sorts prior to 
anything uh, to getting sick. Um, I, 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 uh, but one of the things that I really do think is really critical, I've had the privilege of working with some extraordinarily talented Emmy experts, physicians, clinician scientists uh, for our research studies at Columbia um, and uh, with a national network uh, of, of uh, uh, physician, uh, clinician scientists. And so I've learned so much about the types of uh, diversity and also their approaches. And it's really, to me, a huge equity issue to get this type of expertise to everyone, right? So, you know, uh, we work with five or six. I mean, there's, there's really a few dozen experts in this area. So what we're working on now as part of the effort with Solve ME, and they've committed to uh, to uh, to uh, providing some of the funding for doing this. We're looking for additional funding, but we're adding a virtual component. We have some relaxation right now of the rules of uh, sort of practicing across straight lines. This is going to be done in a research capacity to begin with, but we also want to be able to bring our clinician scientists through, you know, mobile platform, virtual platform to help with and to finalize the diagnosis, to provide their expertise for diagnosis, and then to additionally provide um, consultation later as a later step to provide consultation from clinician scientists to local docs, local groups of docs. Uh, There's a uh, Jamie Seltzer, who's uh, part of ME Action, is, uh, has talked of these, about these as pods. So I call them Seltzer pods. Um, and uh, so there's these, you know, the idea that you're going to have groups locally of docs. You're not consulting directly to the uh, for the to to the patient, but rather to the docs who are seeing the patient and hopefully are enhancing the local capacity to understand what this diagnosis is how to manage it over time. We don't have any cures. We don't have any real understanding of the causes as yet. Um, and even if we understand what the triggers are, that doesn't mean that we understand the biological mechanisms and have ways to reverse them or palliate. You know, those. So, so I feel like the answer to most, I have a million questions about things like um, the biological mechanism and the heterogeneity. And I feel like the answer to most of them is probably that we don't know. Um, but I wonder, it sounds like from both of your experiences that you had very different presentations with the COVID-19 part of this. Um, do we know of anything like what proportion of COVID-19 patients or anything that uh, might they might all have in common um, before they end up um, with long-term COVID? It doesn't seem like we we don't really know. And I will say that there's, you know, there's studies that are starting now and there's also some studies that have been done. But one of the real issues that keeps coming up, especially with some of the the initial studies that have been done, you know, there was one out of out of Italy that that looked at neuro effects on on COVID patients, on long COVID patients. Um, a lot of them are focusing on hospitalized patients and and th- those, you know, kind of defining it as those with acute cases. Um and I think that that is, it, it's difficult, right? Because uh, honestly, a lot of the long COVID patients that I'm in touch with were never hospitalized. And there was a while where that was actually a part of the definition that I was seeing for long COVID, people with initially mild presentations. And then this question of hospitalization is also very difficult because it's, you know, because healthcare systems were overwhelmed, whether or not you were hospitalized, it has something to do with how serious your case was, but it also has a lot to do with when you sought care and in what location. I mean, if I had so and who you a week are, later. And, who you and who you are. Yeah. I mean, I, I wore my Yale sweatshirt to the ER. <laughs> because I thought, here I am, I'm 26 years old. I want to make sure someone thinks I matter. You know, it was uh, so and, and we've heard so many stories, obviously, of, you know, especially. Um, you know, people of color and black women in particular being turned away from kind of acute care centers in the height of the pandemic here in New York. So that's something, you know, body politic is in conversations with the CDC and the NIH about some of the the studies that they're hoping to put together. And that's something that, you know, we're kind of discussing is how do we expand the criteria to include more patients, not just those who are hospitalized, and also to include some of those patients who, you know, didn't, weren't able to access testing early on, because, you know, if we, if we just look at patients with a positive diagnostic test, we're not going to be able to include, you know, the majority of patients who got sick in New York in March and April. But then at the same time, if you open it up to just anyone who thinks they have COVID, then there's a lot more variables 
going on. So that's kind of an ongoing. I, there there is a, would be a reason, I think, to sort of uh, have have a separate study cohorts for those who did test positive and for those who didn't test positive, just to sort of, you know, it's understandable in a research context, you would might want to have that definitive, obviously, um, marker for that someone actually did have it. But oh, almost, oh, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, actually, and we're taking that approach. I think that's really, it's really critical. We're, like, we're including them in the studies uh, as, as probable, analyzing. right? As, and we're going to have clinical criteria as well as the the, you know, the diagnostic test criteria. So you'll have some people who are probable, positive, probable, negative, because there's also, you know, pandemic stress that we need to be thinking about, right? So that's a, you know, that's going through everyone, you know, to, to some degree. That's a really challenging one, though, because that also comes up against, and we should talk a little bit, uh, maybe, I, you know, there isn't anybody on this panel with ME, um, but uh, um, I guess, uh, you know, we, it, 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 it is helpful to talk about that the, the gaslighting, the medical gaslighting that patients with ME have gotten for decades uh, and being told um, because they, you know, they, they, most of them, many of them, uh, or it's post-viral or post-report of a viral illness. But of course, it, they get diagnosed a year or two later or many years later. So it's only their own testimony that they had a viral illness often. Um, but, you know, the medical gaslighting is astonishing. And, I, you know, the same, you hear a lot of the same stories. I mean, the, the, whatever their symptoms are, the stories of people going to doctors after a viral illness and having nonspecific symptoms that can't be traced to specific cardiac or whatever, and they get the same crappy treatment from the medical profession because doctors seem to not be able to want to deal with things that they don't understand. And so the similarity of the stories from um, people with long COVID or whatever one calling it, uh, if especially if their symptoms, even if they have a test, positive test, but their symptoms later, six months later, are non-specific fatigue and so on, it gets psychologized. And so one of the wonderful things that's happened this week um, uh, in the ME world is that in the there's been a big fight for several years over clinical guidelines put out from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, uh, in the UK, which is kind of not parallel to the, it says my internet, am I being heard? It says my internet connection's unstable. Yeah, um, anyway, so the, you know, the CDC, they're not really parallel to the CDC, but they do clinical guidance. And there's been a big fight over the clinical guidance because the 12 year old clinical guidance that they've been, 13 year old clinical guidance has been recommended cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy on the presumption that people are solely deconditioned and or they're, 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 they have unhelpful illness beliefs that they need to have alleviated by cognitive behavior therapy. So both of those modalities are to get people to get back to their regular activity on the theory that they are deconditioned. Um, am I coming through? Your voice is. Yeah, yeah you're okay. okay. My screen was frozen here. Yeah, you're a, you're um, a little wonky occasionally, but you're mostly okay. 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 So Nothing unusual. Uh, this has been an ongoing yeah. struggle that, that has been going on. And so finally, the NICE just yesterday uh, released its uh, clinical guidance, draft clinical guidance that will be fought over in the next few months. But it basically get, does away with this um, paradigm that is really a medical gaslighting paradigm that patients are mainly deconditioned and need either cognitive behavior therapy or graded exercise therapy. So those treatments as sort of curative treatments or, or the new guideline says we have no treatment for the illness. There is no identified cure. These treatments that have been recommended are not cures. And so that's a very strong statement and it's kind of astonishing. And the people who uh, have been pushing the other side, who are very prominent people in the UK, I seem to be a little beside themselves. Their responses to this, which they've put out, are just like, you know, they don't really know what to do because they've lost control of the narrative uh, over this illness. And it's important in the context of uh, long COVID because especially in the UK, less so here, but to some degree, we hear people here getting told that they need exercise or they need, they're just deconditioned from post-viral, so they need to exercise or they need this other stuff. 
For some people with long COVID, that may be good. For other people, it may be like ME, if they have an ME kind of thing where they have relapses if they do too much, they, if they exceed what their bodies can manage, they have serious relapses. It's not just that they're deconditioned. So to have this shift in the paradigm in, in, in ME-CFS happening is very helpful because in the UK, there's been a big fight because a lot of the doctors are prescribing exercise and psychiatric care, psychological care for people with long COVID on the presumption that it's just like ME once you can't find any any anything. So this is going to really put a damper on that and, and stop that. Uh, to a certain degree, which is great because for people with ME, ramping up their exercise is really harmful. It causes damage. It's not a curative thing. It causes further damage. And so, uh, you know, I think there it does seem to be this unclear overlap between these two syndromes, um, you know, and I'm sure they're separate in many ways, obviously, but there, there does seem to be this overlap, and especially in terms of the experiences of the patients. I, I would love just for a moment to emphasize, first of all, Dave, I mean, your doggedness in going after this issue, uh, you know, has, it, it, as a journalist, has been so critical to this, uh, to this effort. So I, kudos to you and also to Vincent well, for, and me also platform. to Vincent for allowing for the platform for, through Virology Blog. I mean, that has been uh, really, really critical. So this is, I, I mean, I'm so glad you had, the timing was such that you were able to, you know, to uh, showcase what that, uh, what that is. It's, it's, it's incredibly significant. Thank you. I, I feel really good about it. So, and I, I really do want to thank Vincent who, uh, you know, from, for five years now has basically let me hijack his platform to pursue my efforts to debunk what really is complete nonsense, anti-scientific nonsense. And it's horrible when I hear it being applied to people with long COVID. It's just insanity. And I have compared it a lot to Trumpian logic. I mean, it's like they see facts and they claim other things. And I, you know, it's really astonishing to me to see that in the scientific world and to see journals, The Lancet, BMJ, publishing what is clearly garbage and refusing, refusing to deal with it, refusing to take action, ref insisting that the studies are good, doing ridiculous corrections, you know, I mean, uh, you know, that, that, that don't respond to, to the concerns. It's, it's really been a shocking experience for me over the years. I guess it shouldn't have been, but I, I've, I've been very, you know, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Well, but do, do you think that this is going to help change the narrative for, for COVID-19 related prolonged symptoms because I, I, I just, I have the experience. I'm, uh, what's today? Wednesday. So uh, on Friday, I'm presenting uh, some of our plans for future grants on this specific issue, right? Sort of this, you know, COVID-19 MECFS, uh, you know, parallel. Um, and I had originally written th the first part of this grant back in May when I was sick, <laughs> you know, first week of May and, you know, not feeling very well. And so I was rereading this just in the past couple of weeks and re recognizing that we have made progress in terms of what's out there in the literature, the acceptance that there is this phenomenon. It's not universal and it's not in the field enough with all doctors. And of course, they also have nothing in their toolkits. You know, they can't open up the doctor's bag and do something about it. So that also is an issue. But I do see that there's really been some shift. I, I, I was actually quite astonished at all the things that I was suggesting that we don't know yet. Now we do know that there are multiple sites around the world that are reporting about 40% of individuals who do not get better within a few weeks and who may have prolonged symptoms for 12 weeks or more. I think that I think that the post-COVID situation, for me, it seems, and there's been a lot of debate about this in the ME community on the forums and stuff, but to me, it seems like it really is a worldwide natural science experiment where it is now obvious to everybody that people can have a viral illness and then have chronic nonspecific symptoms that can't be traced to anything in particular at, as of now. And that it doesn't mean if they're fatigued six months after a serious viral illness, it doesn't mean that they're making it up or that they're depressed or that, they, I mean, maybe they are depressed, but it doesn't mean they're having fatigue 
and all the other symptoms that people get because they're depressed. Um, and I think that paradigm has been so destructive, so harmful for now going on with ME 30 years. You know, this has been going on for these people for 30 years. And one of the things that's astonishing is to, and, and the reactions of people or ME is often, and again, I wish we had someone here, but they've been homebound for 10 years. And now they see all these people with long COVID like, oh, you're complaining two months for homebound, look at me. So there's a very intricate combination of sort of, not schadenfreude, I wouldn't say that, but just sort of, uh, uh, glad that there's recognition of this reality, anger that they're still being dismissed. Why has this taken so long for them when suddenly, you know, it's the doctors are getting it now and they're recognizing that they have it. There's a whole court of doctors, especially in the UK. I mean, you know, in, who, who have been involved in the ME stuff or haven't been involved, but had the same attitudes towards p patients with ME as everybody else has, which that they're just a bunch of whiners. Uh, can't they get it together? And now they themselves are having long COVID and having similar experiences and saying, hey, we got it wrong. We're sorry. How could this have happened? You know, and I think that there is kind of, and I think I am I, actually, I, you know, I have no one's told me this, but I think these new nice uh, draft guidance, I would guess that there's been such attention to this issue that it would be harder in this context, even just without looking at, Without looking at any long COVID evidence, just the phenomenon has made it much harder to insist that people with ME are just just need exercise and psychotherapy. I think that becomes a non-starter in a world where we have really hundreds of thousands or millions of people suffering from non-specific long-term symptoms after a viral illness. So I think David, you, David the, you, des the, you, you describe a, a a specific or a, a pretty intense problem in the UK with respect to this is the Much attitude towards is the attitude towards ME similar in the US and in other countries are there similar problems or is there heterogeneity in the outlook on this there's more heterogeneity now i'd say in the last 5 years so um basically the the UK paradigm has been the paradigm for 30 years and it was the paradigm in the UK in the US as well supported by the CDC um, the CDC under uh you know and and about 5 years ago um in 2015, the Institute of Medicine uh, and the NIH both issued reports that they uh, uh, commissioned, which basically made it clear that this was a you know a, an organic d disease that wasn't psychological. They didn't <coughs> have much to say about um, treatment paradigms, but you know they kind of implicitly undermined the claim of psychological and you know need of psychological and exercise therapy. Uh, and they also pointed to the physiological, some of the physiological um, uh, aspects that make people have relapses after they do a minimal amount of exertion. So that becomes the cardinal symptom is not fatigue, but it's this relapse um, or post-exertional malaise, which people have a disproportionate relapse after minimal exertion. Um, so to that extent, exercise is contraindicated or ramping up exercise is contraindicated. And that was clear after in 2015. What also happened around then uh, was I will say that Vincent allowed me to publish a 15,000 word investigation the same year of PACE, the PACE trial, which was the standard kind of, quote, definitive trial that, quote, proved that graded exercise therapy and uh, cognitive behavior therapy worked. The whole thing is completely ridiculous. It's a big mishmash of nonsense. It's, it's complete garbage. And, you know, I think the fact that they've protested and they've accused me of this and they've accused Vincent of this and that and, you know, all this uproar in the UK... Um, but this new NICE guidance shows that they've lost control of the narrative. It, you know, that the, the, all those studies have been rated in the at review here as uh, low, uh, a very low quality evidence. So their Uber five million pound trial is now officially, in, according to NICE, low quality evidence that can't be relied on. So I think um, that shift has all has took because that wasn't as powerful in the U.S. The CDC three years ago removed these uh, exercise and psychotherapy guidelines, but they've always, they've never really come out and said, they've really been bad. And I've harassed, not harassed them, I've criticized them sharply for never saying, we got it wrong. We believed this, this paradigm and we got it wrong. If they were actually decent public health people in this particular division of the CDC, the CDC's overall excellent organization, but in this particular division, if they were respectable, public health people with integrity, they would say, we got it wrong. 
we're really sorry. They've never done that. They've kind of used mealy mouth language to try to get around and say people misunderstood. But it has had an effect here. It's just that the divisions are much sharper in the UK. And um, so the, the conflict is much sharper and the fall down of these people will come harder, I think. Um, last year, Kaiser Permanente made a big about face in Cal Northern California and said, hey, after a lot of patient activism, we got it wrong. We're sorry. This paradigm that we've used is just completely bogus. You know, they announced that completely, that they got it wrong. So there is a shift here. It's quieter. And the the treatment of patients has been as bad, but it's not been as as bad in terms of the entire institution. Could You could find a doctor who might be sympathetic here if you had good health insurance, or you could find, you know, you have more freedom in the healthcare system here. There, the national health system just does one thing, and there are CFS clinics, and they do one thing. And this is what they do. These are the evidence-based guidelines that they claimed. And it turns out they were based on completely bogus evidence. Fiona, Fiona I so, think you've been wanting to say something, right? I was just going to say that, um, you know, I think David touched a little bit on kind of the the relationship between COVID patients and ME patients from this perspective of seeing that COVID is getting all of this attention and, and some of the feelings that that brings up for people who have been advocating for, you know, change on these issues for a very long time. Um, and I'll say that, you know, while I see a lot of, you know, kind of amazing coalition building between these two groups, and I think it's, it's absolutely the case that, you know, when you have when you have tons of long COVID patients that are following ME patients on Twitter, they're retweeting these, you know, these critiques of rated exercise therapy, right? And then more people are learning about it. And so the issue is getting bigger. At the same time, there is also tension between these two groups. And I have noticed that actually, especially yeah. with long COVID patients in the UK, there is less sometimes willingness to work with the ME community and a, a concern that long COVID patients are going to be, um, inappropriately misdiagnosed with ME when they really have something different. Um, so, you know, I, I think, again, it's coming from from intense fear on on both sides. And, and obviously, both both of these groups have, have been through a lot. Um, but but this difference in kind of the way that the UK has has approached ME has has trickled down, not just from the clinicians to, to even the patients, where I do see a difference in the way that kind of advocacy patient patient advocacy groups in the UK are dealing with these issues versus, you know, those in the US or some other countries. There's a lot of conflict often between some of the UK approaches in, in, in the ME world and the US approaches and in the nomenclature. So I get criticized for using ME-CFS because in the UK, they just want to use ME. In other countries, they use CFS, meaning what other people use ME. And so it's all a big mishmash. And there is the difference in how these terms are understood and approached in the UK and in the US. And I would assume the same in with the COVID uh, as well. And there is a lot of fear among ME people that long COVID will get all the attention and they'll still be left in the in, in you know to, to suffer on their own because they don't have a COVID. They didn't have COVID, they just had ME. So there is, I think that's an issue to, you know, that is, there is tension there, like Fiona says. Yeah, I want to- And there's also a fear that there won't be enough resources if if right. all of these long COVID patients end up getting diagnosed with ME or need to, to see, you know, the clinicians. It's, the ME people that I'm in touch with in New York, they say, there's only two clinicians in New York that, that we can even go to. You know, what happens if there's even a thousand more ME patients? So I think while um, in some level, there's also, you know, hope that a global pandemic means there will be attention toward this issue. I think there's also a sort of sca scarcity mentality and fear that there's not going to be enough resources to go around, which currently there may not be. Which is maybe it's a very valid, you know, it's a very valid concern. Uh -huh. yeah. part, part of that issue, I think, though, is that we also don't have anything, as I said before, there's nothing to fill the doctor's toolkit, right? We need research so desperately so that we can understand what to do about some of these phenomena. I, you know, I have a multitude of things that are going on, you know, dermatological, cardi cardiolo you know, cardiovascular, uh, metabolic, endocrine, you know, uh, as well as sort of general, you know, general stuff. Stuff. Um, and uh, it's all piecemeal. I've got, you know, it's like, I feel like it's like 20 different band-aids, right? So, okay, we're going to start this drug and that's what we recommend, you know, so all these different new drugs, it's like, well, wait a second. I didn't have any of these problems before. I had a lot of other problems, but, you know, and those are continuing, but here I have all these new onset issues. So we're just going to throw medications at them. Isn't I keep saying, like, where's Occam's razor? There's like a whole big mess, you know, nested, you know, hair 
that, you know, you need to cut through all this heterogeneity and just sort of cut through and say, okay, there's one single explanation that can address at least, you know, a portion of all of these issues. And we can focus on that mechanism and try to do something that's more definitive, right? Or even say, step back for a minute and say, okay, we'll be there with you. We're going to monitor along because this is the textbook that's written, you know, with erasable ink because we don't exactly, you know, or whether they're the digital equivalent is of erasable ink, right? So we have to keep editing it as we go, as we go along, because we're writing this story, you know, as, as uh, I think Fiona used the, that term, you know, we're writing it as we're going along. We don't really know what the future is for, for everyone. So, um, yeah. So maybe sort of coming off of that, a lot of the time here, I've been thinking about, um, trying to understand, trying to hypothesize about mechanisms and things. Um, And is there anything that's known about that single underlying mechanism or are people trying to, is there research that people are trying to do to figure that out? Well, absolutely. And uh, one of the, uh, perhaps it's my pet uh, personal hypothesis, and it also fits with some of the work that I've been doing in, in ME, uh, and others as well, is uh, related to autoimmunity, that we have some uh, increasing evidence that for a subset of people with COVID-19, uh, that there are autoantibodies, antibodies that are attacking one's own different receptors and so forth. And because ACE2, for example, you can get antibodies against ACE2. And actually we know in certain classical autoimmune diseases, you have antibodies against ACE2. Sometimes these have behavioral and, uh, and effects with POTS and so forth. Uh, so, so it, for example, there's been, there've been studies which found that, uh, it, individuals with, um, other, uh, with, with factors that, uh, can lead to altered ACE2, uh, uh, function, genetic variants that may make uh, certain kids with ADHD more at risk for developing autoantibodies against ACE2. And ACE2, of course, is the receptor that, uh, or enzyme that, that, that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses to get inside the cells and so forth. So I, I, just in case some listeners have uh, are wondering about all the verbiage we're using here. Um, so anyway, so kids with ADHD who have this phenomenon, um, ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, you know, but also has this brain fog component, perhaps, you know, attentional issues, which are found and, you know, uh, problematic for people with both ME as well as in, in COVID-19. Um, if you are, uh, these kids uh, often have POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So they change position, their pulse rate goes up and they get this, you know, uncomfortable racing heart. If you are able to address the, uh, uh, the tachycardia issue um, for these kids with ADHD, their ADHD diagnosis goes away. Oh, wow. You know, it's a subset. You know, it's just a subset and they haven't addressed it yet immunologically and not everybody responds to some of the treatments for for POTS. But, you know, uh, we do know that there are antibodies, autoantibodies in ME that are against uh, certain uh, parts of the autonomic nervous system, these receptors that are in your blood vessels, the adrenergic uh, uh, receptors. And uh, those are found in individuals with ME. And some people with ME have responded to certain treatments that help to reduce the loading uh, in your blood in your bloodstream of those offensive uh, autoantibodies. It's an immunoglobulin, IV intravenous immunoglobulin therapy, for example. Um, but we haven't done it specifically enough. The antibody tests are not so great uh, or consistent. So, you know, but these are, these are, th- so the virus itself has, we know there's this enormous uh, uh, overlap uh with all of these different uh, proteins with it or stretches of proteins within the virus that map up to all sorts of proteins in our, you know, in the human body and in, inside and, 
you know, on the outside of our cells. And in fact, when you look at some of the uh, studies that have been done, that's actually, if they've used this to advantage to try to figure out what drugs might work in, in, uh, in COVID-19 because, you know, repurposing drugs that already exist, uh, we know go out, you know, that uh, are working at certain receptors. So we know that some of this may uh, be at play and we know there are autoantibodies that are reported, classical autoantibodies that are reported, that are known to be associated with classical autoimmune diseases that are being reported in at least a subset of people with COVID-19. Whether this is going to be for the people who have persistent symptoms, we don't know yet. But anyway, I do think that there's likely to be an autoimmune thing. We also don't know all sorts of really cool things that have been reported to me, cool but very unfortunate, which is that uh, at least certain uh, pieces of the viral RNA, whether it's infectious or not, whether it you know, is, is a whole other story, but uh, people have found in what's called extracellular vesicles. So that, you know, exosomes, so you actually have these lipid, little lipid beads in a way that are circulating through your bloodstream that take what we call cargo. And some of that cargo can be pieces of the molecular parts of the, uh, of the virus that are, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 that are able to be transported. And because they are covered with a lipid surface, a lipid envelope, they can have an easier time getting into the brain, oh. you know, to pass the blood brain barrier, all sorts of possibilities. But a lot of that is speculative at this time. Currently, we're also looking to see whether we have, um, we're, looking at some options for some uh, field deployable uh, tests for T cell, looking to see whether people, their immune system, their T cells and their immune system uh, at long periods after the initial uh, infection um, are still able to respond to SARS-CoV-2. So we can look at that and see whether there's T cell reactivity, even if the antibody and the molecular tests are negative. So yeah, lots to explore and so much to do. I mean, we need to even just start by defining the clinical side, right? So how can we help docs to recognize that this symptom exists before we know more about the biological end or what to do about it? That's all really interesting. I came across an interesting COVID autoantibody preprint yesterday, and now I want to pull it back up and take a look at it again. Fiona, um, (laughs) I know you you have to leave soon, but I I want to have you share with us your background, uh, where you are today. Yeah. Um, So I'm calling in from Upper Manhattan. Um, I've been in New York City for the for the full eight months of of the pandemic. Um, So I've seen this this ghost town. (laughs) What was that, David? I I think it's eight months already. I just see it's it's hard to time just has totally collapsed. Yeah. Yeah. Who even knows what that means anymore? Um, but, but yeah, my, my background, um, I'm a journalist, an independent journalist and a TV producer and a media consultant, um, and have typically focused on, you know, the intersections of health, wellness, uh, culture and and social justice. Um, and prior to the pandemic, I, I ran this event series based in New York city that would, you know, kind of focus on the, on those topics. So we, we would have, um, you know, Things about uh, some of our past events included, you know, self-defense and physical empowerment in the time of Trump. Um, we had various kind of, you know, martial arts and and, and other, other people in that field come on and talk about kind of the politics of self-defense, um, that sort of thing, movement and sexuality. Um, and then, you know, when the pandemic hit and... Uh, someone that I work worked closely with on body politic was also sick. Um, we realized that it had just been crucial to have each other through the process of being ill and that that sort of peer to peer support could, could probably be useful for other patients. Um, and around that time, I also, uh, had written about my experience of being hospitalized at, at 26 for COVID, uh, in the New York times. And so I was already connecting with a lot of patients online. So we launched the, the body politic COVID-19 support group and, um, it, it, it grew kind of steadily. It was It was small at first, maybe 30 or so people. And then I, I wrote a, a second article in the New York Times maybe two weeks later about noticing that a lot of the people in this group were not getting better um, and that I myself also didn't seem to be getting better at the rate that I had expected. Um, and I remember when I, when I pitched that piece thinking, I don't actually know if this is anyone's going to be interested in this and even talking to a couple friends about it. And I'm saying, I don't know, I guess you could try pitching that. And uh, 
you know, luckily an editor at the New York Times took took the chance on this because um, it, it more or less went viral, you know, to to use a term that has multiple meetings at this point. Um, <laughs> and we had over 2000 people sign up to join our support group overnight. So, um, you know, and everyone was saying like, oh, my God. I've been going through this alone. I had no idea anyone else was going through it. And, and you still get weirdly those types of messages when people join the group, because even though, you know, for us, for me, especially working in media, and you know, I work on a COVID news show part time and I'm and, and very it plugged into this world. It feels like everyone is talking about long COVID. But I think the truth is that there's still a lot of patients out there that are experiencing these symptoms, but don't really know what to call it because, you know, the clinician they go to isn't 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 sure of what's going on. Um, have you have you run into something that that I see in happening in the UK with some long COVID patients is that they get told you know they're uh, the same way that the in the UK they thought the fact that people were going around saying there's an illness called ME would convince some people to think that they had an illness called ME that they're you know that they really didn't have and that there really isn't such an illness. There's a sort of a meme going around that um, all this talk of long COVID is inducing people to think they have long COVID and to overfocus on their symptoms and so on and so forth. The same kind of thing that we hear about ME and that that is causing this apparent you know wave of long COVID. Do you hear that people sort of flinging that at you? Yeah, I mean, I, I see some of those threads on Twitter um, and, and there's, you know, oftentimes there's also either implicitly or explicitly stated the idea that people are bored and, you know, this is one way to kind of get attention or or that this is the, you know, COVID is the word of the moment. So why not kind of attach right. yourself to it? Mm-hmm. Um, I think obviously patients are very upset when they when they see these sorts of messages. And as, and my experience is that, you know, the majority of the people that I connect with have really been suffering alone and in the dark and, and aren't even aware of this term right. until they kind of find a group like this. And, and, you know, I had, I had one of my neighbors who, who runs a wine shop in my neighborhood emailed me the other day saying, what is the law? What is the sign up for your group? Because I have tons of customers saying, and they had coming and saying they had COVID and they still haven't recovered. You know, I had, so there's, it feels like almost everyone in my own life that I've spoken to, just even friends and family who have had this illness or, you know, have at least one or two kind of odd things, whether it's one, my partner had one COVID toe for about four months, every other symptom was gone, except for this one COVID toe or, you know, phantom smells or phantom tastes. Um, that and, and a lot of times they're not actually aware of the term and they're just saying, oh, I heard you were sick too. I just found out. So, you know, do, do you know what's going on? So that, that, feels like a more common scenario to me than people who are kind of really plugged into the COVID news and reading about long COVID and then saying, hmm, maybe yeah, I, this is something I have. I think that's, but, I think that's the more normal way it happens. It gets interpreted differently by those who have different interests of, of think, wanting to think the whole thing is a psychiatric syndrome. Yeah. And I think that often, now the idea that there's been media attention around this, I, I've seen a couple of threads on Twitter that are almost using that to try and, you know, say that that the numbers are over exaggerated or that, you know, this is a this is a phenomenon that's been overblown by the media, which as you know, one of the first people who actually wrote about this phenomenon in in early April, um, that's that's obviously not my experience. My experience has been trying constantly to kind of push these media stories forward and and correct, you know, that for a long time, there was a focus only on, again, those hospitalized patients, the impacts of the ventilators and the drugs that people had been on, you know, while, while, while they were being ventilated. Um, so I still feel like there's still not not enough stories out there, and there's still so many aspects of the patient experience that aren't being covered. And, and I now write, you know, pretty exclusively about the COVID-19 patient experience. I'm working on a piece right now about a uh, COVID patients and their caretakers and and kind of what the caregiving uh, experience has been like during this pandemic. But um, so that's my perspective, you know, and, and I also think that that we put those stories out there because, you know, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist. So how else am I supposed to get the word out? And kind of awareness raising is, I think, often the first step of, of advocacy movements, especially patient advocacy movements. Fiona, because I've had uh, a couple of times when I've written a couple of long COVID pieces where I have then people writing to me and saying, it's, you know, this is COVID porn. You know, I'm mean, actually, they use long COVID porn, you know, that it's just gar- nonsense and you're just out there convincing people. Like I had one recently about teenagers, you know, who seem to have long COVID. Now, uh, clearly, they're much less impacted and less likely to get sick and less likely to have serious consequences. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. The story didn't say this is happening all over the place. It just said here are a few cases. But then I got these, you know, texts and whatever, you know, whatever on Twitter or whatever. I don't really, I don't care. But it was sort of like I was, you know, fostering a thing where more kids are going to be coming up with these things because they don't want to go to school or whatever it is. 
So well, I also noticed that that story, David, some of the comments that I saw were similar to other comments I've seen on Twitter saying it's largely, you know, upper middle class uh, right. white women who are reporting these symptoms. And often there's the implication that, you know, for that reason, they shouldn't be trusted. Um, and I think it, it does seem to be the case that long COVID may disproportionately impact uh, women. But the idea that it's a that it's an illness that's, you know, impacting upper middle class white people is is seems to be a myth, in my opinion. And, and you know, there's there's a reason that we're here hearing those stories, right? I, I mean, just, just even, I was able to get access to a doctor, right? I, I had, I, I didn't experience right. medical racism. I, I didn't experience gaslighting to the extent that, that a lot of other folks have. I spoke to a, a young uh, Latina woman in, in California yesterday um, who had tested positive multiple times for COVID, but still was not able to get her doctors to run tests on her. So, you know, those are the stories we're hearing, but, but that's, you know, because oftentimes it, it goes undiagnosed um, in, in communities of color, I think. So, we're well, trying. Also, women women, women, women are more likely to come forward and seek care. Men are more likely to try to, you know, avoid care. So women are disproportionately going to be coming forward. But it is true that in the ME world, uh, you know, it's disproportionately women. And women are, I think, also, you know, even just speaking as myself, this is not the first time that I have had to seek a second opinion to to try and get competent care. So I think also that in some cases, people, you know, from marginalized populations are kind of more used to navigating these healthcare systems and perhaps more willing to say, I don't think what I've been diagnosed with is correct. I unfortunately have to go to a, a client meeting right now, but this was great. And it was it was lovely to meet all of you and, and Fiona, see you again, David. Um, uh, before you go. Uh, what is your what's your favorite term for this disease? Uh, Mady said long term COVID nineteen. What do you think? Yeah, I'm fine with long term COVID nineteen. Okay. I've been I, my only issue with that is that it was co the person who I think originated that is you know the founder of a U.S. support group and long COVID is the term that kind of internationally patients and patient advocates have been using for a long time. So I tend to defer to that term just because it's really been in the vernacular for longer and seems to have come from a real grassroots international effort. But if long-term COVID-19 ends up, you know, becoming popular, I'm, I'm definitely fine with that. All right. Fiona Lowenstein, yeah. Body Politic. Thanks so much. Thanks Thank you. It was really interesting. Thanks, Fiona. That was great. Bye all. Great to meet you. I, I want to reference a, a blog post by Jenny Spotila, who I've known for a while as a, a ME patient. Um, I've actually met her <clears throat> At meetings. So I got involved in this because many years ago, uh, it was suggested that a retrovirus might be involved. Um, and that got Wasn't me involved. Wasn't that 800 years ago now? <laughs> uh, yeah, at least. Long term ago. The and speed that 2020 is going? Yes. <laughs> and so that's how I met uh, David. And uh, I, I ended up going to some uh, Emmy meetings and I met Jenny at one of them and have kept in touch. Uh, she wrote this blog post called I Want to Scream, which echoes some of the things we've discussed oh. that she said, I've been dealing with this for 26 years. And now all of a sudden it's getting attention with, uh, you know, long COVID-19. And, you know, as as David said, it, it drives those patients crazy. And I wonder, though, is this going to be an advantage? Because now we know uh, the trigger, right? There's a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And it is happening. I think it validates a lot of the ideas about MECFS. Um, one of the problems with ME is that funding has been poor, relatively poor compared to other, considering how many people are afflicted, right? Maybe uh, this will improve. And I wanted to ask Mady, um, is this being recognized by, say, NIH? Is it going to get funding? Well, there's... A little bit of a glimmer of hope, but there are several uh, intramural efforts that are ongoing now that are dovetailing with a an intramural MECFS study that's uh, started, I think, about two years ago. Um, so it being, you know, uh, spearheaded at uh, NINDS. So I think that that is... Um, a, uh, I think that that's a good thing to hear. Uh, there is in a legislative uh, effort, you know, so for advocacy, there's been a request for an increase to $15 million a year, which is really not very much, you know, uh, when we're thinking about the prevalence of ME even before what we project might be added to the numbers uh, with, uh, you know, in the, the, the uh, 
what it was a you know uh, the AC the year is years AC after <laughs> coronavirus right so <laughs> um, so I I I think that we really do need to have um, a, a continuation and a stepping up and amplification of all of the voices that have been clamoring for so long for uh, research funding for uh, for Emmy. We want to understand this in a much uh, more in depth. Uh, manner. And we need to be uh, moving very rapidly to translate clues that we obtain into something that we can at least try, even if it's not an approved drug that just sort of, you know, having research that says, you know, that uh, working on, you know, uh, boosting immune system or anti-inflammatory, adding some, some type of anti-inflammatory can help, et cetera. You know, we may not be able to move precisely to a specific drug that's just for ME or that we're, we have FDA approval for that, but, you know, we, we need to, uh, start to do this research that allows doctors to know what to do because, even if you recognize this disorder, what do you do about it? I mean, I sort of think back to, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the days before lithium, right? So lithium we think of as a standard drug for manic depressive illness, right? But in the days before there was a recognition that left lithium in the early 60s that, you know, that lithium might address this disorder, bipolar disorder, manic depression, was often misdiagnosed and sort of put in with uh, schizophrenia or other, you know, other disorders. We didn't really understand uh, all of this. And those sorts of uh, interventions can make, a, you know, a big difference once you recognize the disorder. That's a first step, but you also need I think to really make a difference and change and put, you know, alter where the needle goes uh, in terms of patient outcomes and quality of life, you do need to be able to start to do something even in advance of FDA drugs, right? So, you you know, so management. And that's why I was talking about these sort of seltzer pods and a consultative model. We're looking for ways to try to have experts who are, See, able to see patients. I mean, the, the few experts in ME can't see all of these COVID patients. And there are some COVID-19 centers that have, you know, popped up. It's great. But many of them, I think, are not uh, in a position to really understand the ME type of phenomenon. I think they're really better positioned for the post-ICU, the people who have pulmonary uh, compromise, you know, from having had, you know, a SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia, uh, people who have, uh, who you can see cardiac changes on a cardiac MRI, you know, those, that's a different, that group needs a different type of rehabilitation and they definitely need it. And it's really important to have that component, but the ME type of management is one that's rather specialized. And until you empower physicians, with not only the awareness of the disorder, but of what you can do about it, that's, you know, it's really not going to change things. So there's a few efforts. There's an ME coalition of, of, of docs that is available uh, now that is trying to put some of that out there, but also the direct consultation, because these are going to be complicated patients, you know, and as in real life, you know, people can have, uh, you know, they could have, you uh, whatever, to be diagnosed with hepatitis C and have other things in addition, right? So they get, you know, their curative therapy for hepatitis C, but they also, uh, you know, have other issues that may need to be addressed. So medicine is, you know, is complicated. So we need to be able to uh, really add to this education. I had no education in medical school in, uh, on ME. Who does? Nobody does. Still, There's still, very rarely, very rarely, you know, so, and, and I went to a great clinically focused uh, medical school. So, you know, we did exams, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, that, that people nowadays will send somebody, you know, instead of listening to the heart, you know, they'll send, you know, or listening to the lungs, they'll send them off for an x-ray or an MRI or whatever. So with that, do you, 
I think that that research and mechanistic understanding might also help with things like diagnosis and recognition of the disease and combating some of the gaslighting. I think it will. And I think it will help beyond ME. I think an approach to complex disease, believing the patient, listening to patients, not suspecting that they're gaming you, right? I mean, I think you know one of my big fears in uh, with COVID nineteen and with ME, it, you know, in general, that there's a hesitation, particularly for those that subset of individuals that has uh, pain, prominent pain symptoms. And if you look at the COVID-19 surveys, you know, these long-term COVID surveys, uh, pain has been a very prominent uh, component. So, you you know, there's so much concern, of course, as there should be about how you manage chronic pain, but there are people who are really suffering. And so you do need to be able to, you know, understand what that is about. And if it's an autoimmune neuropathy that's causing that sort of, you know, pain syndrome, um, then, you know, maybe you need some types of treatment tools that are, you know, uh, you know, addressing that. So, yes, I mean, I think this is a really, this is a really, really big issue. I think the attention will help, um, but we have so much territory to go through. And if we don't have the funding from NIH, to, to do this in a big way and in, not in a way that makes it an us versus them, COVID-19 versus ME type of way. I mean, there's really, that that really is, uh, that needs to be addressed. I mean, it's really, we should be thinking about this as, uh, as a phenomenon where the lessons are going to be uh, uh, important for, for all of these types of uh, complex, long-term infection triggered issues. I'd like to also say that, and again, this is more of a UK thing than here, but it is somewhat here. There's this whole new, you know, emerging domain of MUS, quote, medically unexplained symptoms, of which chronic fatigue syndrome in the UK is officially chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, um, all these other things or any any symptom you that they can't link to a direct you know, clinical problem is considered an MUS, a medically unexplained symptoms. And they're teaching primary care docs in the UK to presumptively diagnose anybody with something they don't understand as having MUS so they can immediately be sent off for cognitive behavior therapy as the evidence-based treatment. And the PACE trial, which has now been debunked, is sort of the 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 um, case study of how you cure people or treat them with you know, graded exercise therapy or cognitive behavior therapy. So there's an entire paradigm in the UK, an entire superstructure of a program called the Increasing Access to Psychological Therapies program in which they're sending, the, the goal is to send anybody with unsuspected depression and anxiety disorders directly to cognitive behavior therapy, which makes some sense, I suppose, if they actually have depression and anxiety as a primary thing. If they have chronic fatigue syndrome or they have irritable bowel syndrome, there's no reason to presume that their primary thing is depression or anxiety, but that's what's going on in the UK. And I undoubtedly that will be going on with long COVID patients, which is part of the fight there to, to deal with this issue. And the MUS concept is taken root in the US more in the area of functional neurological disorders, but the larger MUS concept medically has not taken root here in the same way, but I do see conferences here and there uh, about how psychiatrists can identify people with medically unexplained symptoms and GPs can identify people with medically unexplained symptoms so they can then be given appropriate psychiatric treatment. And I'm hoping that the long COVID situation will bust not only the ME paradigm, but also the MUS paradigm uh, really in the UK. So that's sort of <laughs> part of my next project or moving on or, or expanding, I guess, or you know, looking into as well as just the ME situation. Yeah, it's like uh, one thing that would really help is to ultimately understand what something like ME is and how to deal with it so that people can point to that and say, oh, yeah, there was uh, a real organic issue here all along, okay? And so when we see something, another medically unexplained syndrome out there, take it seriously. Right. In some ways, it's sort of the the ability to say, huh, so we didn't 
it was unexplained before and now it's explained. So that exactly. means the next thing that's unexplained could get explained. Yeah. Right, exactly. I, I saw this in, in my work in treatment resistant depression. You know, I uh, would get people, we used to measure some people by the height of their chart. You know, we had paper charts in those days, you know, so people would come in after 10 years of treatment, you know, and it was like a, you know, six inch high uh, set of uh, records to go through. Often when we would, you know, we would work really to try to find out whatever the biological root was. And people would say, well, you know, should I be seeing a therapist, you know, and, uh, you know, would that help in, in addition? And I always advise people to, to not to do that uh, until they got to the point where they were what I called normal, normal, right? So, and sometimes they had never experience normal, normal in their entire lives until they actually got there, right? To, to, to understand what it really is like to have a normal emotional life and to be able to function and to not be burdened by many of the physical manifestations that also are part of, uh, of, of depression. And I often sent them after they got to normal, normal for cognitive behavioral therapy, but almost like a grief therapy, because sometimes they really had to grieve for that part of their life that was, oh, you know, just gone, right? Um, and where there weren't answers and where they were functioning at a less than optimal, in a less than optimal manner. And it was a way to start to work through some of those issues and then also develop some of the skills that uh, to sort of make their lives better that, that were really, uh, from which they were blocked before because of all of the biological factors that were affecting their brain and body, um, uh, you know, it, prior to getting to whatever the biological root was. And sometimes we never got to the root. Sometimes you still had to do the Band-Aid management, a little bit of this and a little sort of symptom type of therapy. And I think we're going to be in that uh, mode for quite some time with with COVID-19, long-term COVID-19, uh, and also with, uh, with ME. Uh, but that shouldn't stop us from trying to get at the underlying roots and to keep going, right? Don't say, don't expect that, you know, um, just because you get a negative answer with a certain type of test that that has already been done. Sometimes you need a fresh look uh, as well as, as we learn more about how to do certain tests, right? You know, with her even postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, right? We, we now test people uh, using what's called the NASA lean test. We don't use a stand, the standard tools that most docs use. We have them lean up against a wall for a shorter period of time, but you know, monitor in a, different, uh, in a different fashion than most docs were trained to do to look for positional changes in your autonomic you know, uh, physiologic response. Anyway. Well, this uh, problem is, is growing because we haven't finished reaching the number of uh, infections yet. Uh, this this pandemic is in its uh, most Stop. aggressive no, form. At least the people who are getting sick now are mostly, I think, having tests. I don't. I probably we won't have the phenomenon. We'll we'll have a cluster of people who didn't have an initial test. You know, and are. I mean, I think most of the people unless they're having asymptom, you know, unless there, it turns out there's a phenomenon where people are having asymptomatic or such mild things, but still having, yeah. you know, medical sequelae afterwards. I don't know if that is a, you know, thing where there could be silent, but, but I presume most of the people having long COVID after this are going to actually have verification that they had COVID in the beginning. Well, I mean, and this is. So um, uh, autoimmunity has been mentioned as a possible uh, etiology for in in both of these circumstances. Is there any evidence that treatment for you know uh, uh, autoimmunity because treatments are available for some autoimmune diseases uh, has any benefit for uh, either ME CFS patients or long haulers? Um, well, for ME CFS patients, there is some limited evidence for uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, which is one of the you know uh, one of the routes to go. Um, 
immunosuppressive therapies, maybe not, you know, um, and then there was a big trial in Norway that used a, um, uh, a, an antibody, a monoclonal antibody against CD20 against a certain type, you know, certain, uh, it, uh, so a B cell, antibody producing cells um, that uh, had started out as a chemotherapy agent. That Study, however, did not select for people who had auto evidence of autoimmunity. It took all comers, um, and um, I'm not sure that that was that would have been the way I would have gone. You know, um, I would have probably wanted to see, and I still think that it may be something useful to do if you have reliable tests to define autoantibodies. So if you have one or more autoantibodies in ME, for example, that you can uh, then, you know, uh, get a trial of, uh, of some of these agents. But they have, you know, most of these uh, immunomodulatory therapies have, you know, some, uh, a big range of side effects that are, can be quite serious. So you do really want to be careful in how you define that. And frankly, our tests for defining um, even the presence of autoantibodies is uh, not always so great. And there may be, in COVID-19 in particular, there may be some targets that are not yet well-defined that are uh, potentially relevant clinically. And so we have a lot of work to do, I think, to make the test better, first of all, right, you know, to figure out who has evidence of autoimmunity and what type of symptom range is associated with that. And then uh, be thinking about how to, uh, how to address it. The classical, really definitive treatment for, uh, pre, you know, for humoral autoantibodies, you know, so humoral autoimmunity, so the presence of autoantibodies is something called plasmapheresis. So you're actually sort of clearing the blood of the offensive antibodies. Um, uh, but again, that has a lot of issues uh, associated with it. Uh, but that is also something that could potentially, you know, be a tool again, but if we have carefully defined, because again, you have to think about the risk benefit ratio, right? So some people use steroids, you know, steroids also have a lot of side effects, right? And so, and so unfortunately in the world of autoimmune diseases, we don't have a whole lot of uh, great, uh, great tools, you know, so um, but the the the, uh, the one the tools that have been used so far in COVID nineteen are ones that are for classical autoimmune diseases, and so they are. And one of the really interesting things to me, putting together this process of what we call thromboinflammation, thrombo meaning a clot, thrombus and and inflammation. Uh, because coagulation, the COVID toes is thought to be little micro thrombi. And I'm like so thankful, as I said, that I was on high dose aspirin, you know, because of that, uh, be, because I think it probably prevented me from having something uh, worse. Um, so the thromboinflammation hypothesis, I think, has lent some additional support um, as a potentially autoimmune phenomenon, at least in the long-term type of clotting problem, they found antibodies that are uh, targeting, you know, uh, these phospholipid, uh, what we call phospholis antiphospholipid antibodies that are involved in the coagulation cascade. So, and those are classical types of autoantibodies. So I, I think uh, putting it together with all the clinical phenomena is the next step. And then beginning to think about how we go about treating these safely and uh, and you know and and really, but you have to have the tools to diagnose and then monitor right whether those things are getting better and and know the relationship of the presence of the and autoantibodies to the clinical phenomenon. I mean, it, it, you know, okay, so we've got five people, you know, five people here, so uh, you know, uh, I think uh, four. Four of us are probably, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, likely to have um, one or more antibodies circulating in our blood that are directed against brain components. 
This is a natural phenomenon. They're very ubiquitous. These auto these autoantibodies are there, but they don't necessarily cause disease in everyone. Now, probably for me, you know, since I have a whole collection, I have the diamond collection of autoimmune diseases. I think I have seven by now. Um, but uh, most people, you know, are without any clinical, uh, you know, uh, reaction to those, uh, to those autoantibodies. And it may, and we don't really understand that, that that's also another piece of it, sort of what makes an, what turns an autoantibody that may be there all the time, what turns it into something that could be pathological? So, so just yeah. for clarification, when you were talking about the thromboinflammation um, mm-hmm. and the autoantibodies, those are the cardiolipin antibodies. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So one thing that's kind of cool, there's some, you know, there, there may be um, influences. So uh, from oxidative stress, a lot of us, you know, have lots of sources of oxidative stress. So some of those antibodies may be more likely to be pathogenic and to cause disease. If you are in a state where you have high oxidative stress or, and or low antioxidant resources in your body or in your mitochondria, you know, the energy powerhouses of your cells or, you know, affecting what's called the peroxisomes. And these are areas, actually, there's like, there's some cool receptors, you know, on mitochondria, MAVs, so the mitochondria associated, you know, know, (laughs) so, so MAVs actually, you know, is, it's, we think about it as being mitochondrial because mitochondrial is in its name, but it's also those, uh, uh, those, it's present on peroxisomes also. Mm-hmm. And peroxisomes, another really important uh, area within a cell that is regulating how, whether we're vulnerable or resistant to viral infections. All right. I think we ought to wrap this up. It's a great conversation. <laughs> uh, that's TWIV 680. You can find TWIV at micro dot tv slash twiv if you want to send us questions twiv at microbe.tv if you like what we do consider supporting us microbe.tv slash contribute so our guest today of course fiona lowenstein has uh, left she's at the body politic Mady hornig is at columbia university school of public health thanks so much for your time we really appreciate it Mady. oh thank you so much for pulling this together and agreeing to do this. It's fantastic. Uh, David Tuller is at the University of California, Berkeley. You can find uh, his writings at virology.blog. Thank you, David. Thank you, Vincent. Of course, you can find his writings in other places, the Times, Stat. Many, many many more (laughs) thousands of words on virology blog. (laughs) Indeed. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor Uh, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Your thing. This was a great conversation. And thank you, Mady and David. And uh, Brianne Barker is over at Drew University on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was really great to be here. Thank you so much, Mady and David and Fiona. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>